Okay. All right. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, great. Well, of course, before we start, it's extremely important that we uh, generate a motivation that makes our time together here most effective. So before we do just one prayer uh, led by Sheila, let's take a moment, just take a deep breath. Just focus on the breath. And then to think that May this time we have together, especially today, become a cause for us to, well, first of all, understand the meaning of this very profound text. In order to gain an understanding of the ultimate nature of ourselves and other phenomena. And in that way, reduce our harmful emotions and replace them with more love and compassion for ourselves and others. Find more inner peace and For an example, be able to help others to find more inner peace and fulfillment. But may also enable us to actualize our fullest potential. in the form of attaining the awakened state of a Buddha. Not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. So it's really with this aspiration of bodhicitta or the mind of enlightenment that we'll study this text today. And let's hold on to this mind while we're reciting the prayers. So Sheila, please go ahead with refuge and once again, generating the mind of enlightenment. Okay, I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened. To the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits, I create through listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened. To the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Thank you. All right. Well, let's start then. As you all know, the text that we're going to study is Recognizing the Mother or Recognizing My Mother by uh, a, a Mongolian, actually a Mongolian author called Changyao Robojoji. And uh, the material that I, well, that Sheila very kindly made available is, of course, the root text as translated by uh, Geshe Thubten Jimpa. And as his holiness taught the text 
well, Lama Sopa Rinpoche requested his homilies to teach this particular text. I think it was in February. And it was my job to translate it into German. And as I was translating it, I mean, I had quite a few Tibetan uh, commentaries, but I didn't have anything in English. I didn't know Jeffrey Hopkins had already translated one of the commentaries I was using. And as I translated it into German, I felt no way anyone's going to understand this. It was about mother and father and brother. <laughs> it's like, it's not definitely not obvious what Changyo Rubudoji was talking about. And so I put together these explanatory notes um, in German, actually, first. And then it wasn't difficult to translate them into um, English. So this is what you've got here. And since Lamas of Rinpoche is one of my Lamas, I offered it to Rinpoche as like a, yeah, like an offering of the work I had done. Um, but of course, then later on, like a day before the teaching started, I found out that actually Jeffrey Hopkins had translated this, this commentary, this shorter commentary, which I'd also used. So this is now available to you. And hopefully you've had the time to already read through it and get a better sense of what the text is all about. I mean, it'd be that much easier, of course, to understand. And uh, well, we definitely go through the entire text, but of course it's also important to discuss this main topic here, which is famous emptiness, very popular in the West, very popular, well, I guess anywhere, but of course also so important and so hard to understand. So we'll spend some time, of course, discussing this particular concept, um, which is, like I said, is the main topic of this text. And uh, like, well, Sheila also announced it. If we have time, I'll take some questions and we'll be able to hopefully discuss it further. So anyway, I'll start right away. But if you haven't looked at the commentary and, and the text yet, and before I forget to say so at the end of this class or at the end of this get together, um, please find some time and read through it. It just makes it so much more helpful. All right, so I'll start right away because we have only little time together. Um, at the beginning of these notes that I put together, there's a short uh, biography, if you like, of the author. Now, I don't want to go through it because you can read it on your own, but just that you get a sense that the person, the author, there's more of a connection to this incredible master, this incredible person who um, was actually of Mongolian descent, but born in, in Tibet, and an incredible scholar and practitioner who was very close to the seventh Dalai Lama. You can read it here. Um, so if you find another, another biography, again, on your own, it just generates this close connection and of course appreciation um, of who this person was of who this master was um, he's also composed other texts uh, quite important text one is called beautiful adornment on mount Meru. it's a text on tenets and has been translated to english just recently i think it was donald lopez not sure who did it but you, you'll find it um, probably on amazon um, it's just been translated or if it hasn't been, well, it's definitely going to be published soon if it hasn't been published yet, but I've seen it somewhere. So very important text that we also use for our own studies. But like I said, it's on this different tenant systems. So if you look at the text, um, it begins with the title, Recognizing My Mother. <laughs> um, of course, from those words, it's not obvious what's meant with my mother. An experiential song on the view, experiential song. It's already a very beautiful way of entitling a text, experiential in the sense it shows that this is not a, a scholastic work as such. It's much more coming from within the author. Like he's basically saying, what I've realized, I'm sharing with you. Um, not implying I've, I've, I've realized so much, I'm really great. No, but in the sense, I've really thought this through, I've, I've internalized these ideas, and this is, this is the, the result. And in that way, these experiential songs, and I'm sure you know, well, of course, Lama um experiential or song, what's it called in, in English now? Song of Experience, I think it's called, by Lama Tsongkhapa, also of a similar nature. And actually, well, most of the 
the texts by the great masters, of course, there are um, songs of experience or there are experiential, but this one here in particular is very poetic. So it's kind of an expression of what they realized. Um, it's very poetic and well, sharing with us his own attainment or his own uh, insights. Starts with the syllable Emma Ho, which expresses amazement and admiration. And then it goes on right to say at the beginning, uh, paying homage. Now this is unusual, I guess, for us. I mean, if we write a text, if we, um, well, write a book or a paper, um, we're not used to paying homage to our teacher. Maybe we mention them in the very beginning, maybe dedicating the text um, to, to the teacher or someone else who's had a great influence on us. But this is actually for us unusual. Well, in the, in the Buddhist context, of course, not unusual. The importance of one's own teacher, the importance of one's own Lama. And teacher here is important to, to well, use the word Lama, actually, I guess more than teacher. I don't like to use the word guru so much, although it's just because it has a bad reputation, but really uh, Lama or guru, like the spiritual master, someone we have a special connection to. And this connection is so important. It's so, it's, it's so helpful. But of course, misunderstood. It's not easy to follow this. Um, a lot of people first have a hard time finding their Lama and, and are very busy trying to find a Lama, though it's actually much more, it, it's something that develops actually more natural. It should allow this to, to, to develop, like finding your own Lama in the sense of listening to different teachings and basically checking, well, whose teachings do we find um, touch us in the most, in the in the in the most effective way, or in the, in the greatest way, and then also, of course, checking the lama, the qualities. It should be someone with realizations. Should be someone, and it's hard, of course, to tell. Um, anyway, it takes time. I mean, Lama Tsongkhapa talks about this process of finding a lama. If it's at least in a certain context, especially in the tantric context, it should take ten years. I mean, it should be a um, a process of really checking this person. But that doesn't mean we cannot generate that special relationship already with someone like, for instance, as Holmes the Dalai Lama. And what I stress again and again in the Western context is this relation, this connection to a spiritual master is completely mental. So you don't have to be physically around this person. There are stories of like biographies of great masters in Tibet and, and, and uh, some of the Himalayan regions, Mongolia, um, where a person's never met their Lama, but still uh, there's this connection. I mean, you can receive their teachings in, in the past, mainly through texts. Um, nowadays, it's so easy to receive teachings by some of the great Lamas. And then it's a mental connection. So even if you don't meet this person, um, it's not necessary. And it inspires us. It, it, it gives, well, this inspiration, it gives something like something from the mind of the Lama affects us if we allow ourselves to connect the, to, to the Lama. And oftentimes the, the Lama is described as someone like, it's like the sun shining everywhere equally onto everything. And we're standing in the shadow. So to connect with the Lama, we just need to step out of the shadow and connect. So it's not like that the Lama wouldn't want to connect with us, but um, that we basically open ourselves up to this person. And that's really it. I mean, it's not, I mean, kind of serving the Lama. We, we hear these kind of ideas, making offerings, but the best offering, the best service is to practice, to just practice what the Lama teaches. So being, generating love, compassion, of course, practicing generosity, patience, etc. That's the best offering, the best service. So I'm getting a bit of a sense of this really strong emotional connection that slowly grows. Of course, it's not there, right, instantaneously, unless there's already a previous life connection with someone. But just getting a bit of a sense of that, then if we read the first verse, so this is here now, 
Changya Robert Joji, from the depth of his heart, this connection, this really strong bond he has towards his own teacher, his own Lama, one of them, one of his teachers being the seventh Dalai Lama, uh, yeah, the seventh Dalai Lama. Um, so also other, there are also other Lamas he has, and he just puts it together in the form as if there was just a singular person. Um, but when I received other teachings on this, um, it was also, uh, well, it was said that there were also other lamas. So here it says, you who reveals bear the wonder of profound dependent nature, dependent nature or dependent arising nature, or oh, my guru, or oh, my lama, your kindness is boundless indeed. All right, so just praising the lama for what he has given, the teaching on dependent arising, of course, so important, the center of teaching on Buddhism in combination, of course, with emptiness and, um, well, selflessness, emptiness, and dependent rising, that is true. So he praises him for this profound teachings on dependent rising. Um, your kindness is boundless indeed. Um, well, presenting, of course, the path to full enlightenment. And so um, here, it says in the commentaries, I'm just reading the, the commentary. So it's this inseparability, showing this meaning of the inseparability of appearances and emptiness, teaching those two together, extremely important, also presented in this text. So please reside in my heart. Um, so this, this visualization that we're also familiar with, this practice that so often done in the form of a sadhana maybe, or just to, even not in a, in a context of a, well, a tantric practice, but just visualizing the Lama at the top of our head and then kind of um, descending into our, through the top of our head, through, to our, through our, well, central channel really, into our heart. So kind of descending into our heart and residing there on a lotus flower. Okay, so no need to go into the significance of the lotus flower and so forth, but just this visualization that we do, again, to generate a sense of closeness towards the Lama. Okay, so here he's saying, please kindly reside in my heart in the way just described. As I utter these spontaneous words from thoughts flickering through my mind, and here spontaneous from thoughts flickering through my mind. This idea of like, well, it's being spontaneous. Um, again, it's an experiential song. It's something that comes from the heart. Um, just anything that comes to mind, uh, not thought through in a scholastic way, but rather from the realizations of Chankya Rupa himself. Okay, let me just check if there's anything in the commentary. Jimmy Wongpo's. Kunju Jimmy Wombo is also a great uh, Tibetan master who's written this short commentary uh, translated by Jeffrey Hopkins, which I believe Jeffrey Hopkins translation is still, um, it's, I don't think it's a final version because I've come across some of the, the words he used. It's very interesting. Tibetans have a, have a, a custom, and I'm not sure actually which version I have. I've seen two versions of Jeffrey Hopkins translation, but in both, I believe he uses, he, he translated some of the terms in Tibetan, which are, you, in Tibetan, it's like, if you want to stress something, you sometimes say the word twice. <laughs> and so he's done that too. I've come across this on, on, a, on a couple of occasions when Jeffrey Hopkins just uses a word, good, good. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, uh, I don't think that's the final version of it. He would probably say very good or whichever way express it. But yeah, well, maybe in the version that you have, you've come across some of these, um, these double kind of like these using two, the, the same word twice. So like I said, Tibetans do that. Sometimes it's the synonyms that are used have the same meaning using both of those. So I don't know, good and great um, if they are synonyms. Well, not really, but anyway, so great and uh, excellent in Tibetan, you have that, or you just have it said twice. Okay, anyway, now it doesn't say anything more in the commentary other than that. And that is just the homage, really. So having expressed homage, having generated, so also in our mind, 
if possible, even though the, the Lama he's addressing here, the, the, the Lama he's talking about here, Jangya Rupa Jorje, um, is not our own personal Lama, but still to generate that sense of, well, appreciation also for whoever has taught Jangya Rupa Jorje. Um, and not just that, um, also to remember our own personal Lama, and of course, understand that the great beings of the past, well, all of them had someone who's taught them. And for Jagyar Rabadoji himself, it's a means to accumulate merit in order to then continue uh, composing this text, being the first verse, accumulating merit, and of course, receiving the inspiration of his own, his own Lama. But for us, it's an opportunity also to um, well, appreciate our own personal lama and so forth. Anyway, then the text goes on with, well, it talks about having three parts. First, there's the introduction, an introductory part. Then there's the actual meaning, the more extensive meaning of the text. And at the very end, the conclusion. So at the beginning here, the way I'm using Kunjutyumi Mwambo's outline. So outlines is something that Tibetans really have developed. In the, the Sanskrit texts, in the original texts, they don't use outlines. They don't use these kind of ways of separating the text into different sections and then giving a title to each section. This is a very Tibetan custom. In the Sanskrit texts, um, they were like, uh, like Tibetan, they said samjur. I forget the English word now. Like uh, kind of uh, texts that allow you to connect. So certain passages that connect you to the next section. So they did divide the text up into sections, but instead of kind of giving a title to each section, it's the end of one section. There was a sentence or two that served as a kind of transferal to the next section. But then the Tibetans um, started with this extremely helpful system of outlines. Many of you probably know that, but just for those of you who don't know this, it's very helpful. It seems initially very confusing. Of course, there are a lot of outlines with titles. I mean, look at the, the great Lam Rim, the uh, treatise on the, the stages of the path to enlightenment. I mean so many outlines but when we studied the text we would usually memorize the outlines and as you memorize you go over again and again and again and again and what happens is slowly you kind of put things into their place so you understand oh this belongs to this this belongs to that part so even before you've studied the text you have some kind of overview studying or, or, or memorizing the outlines enables you to, well, have a bit of a sense what comes first, what comes next, and so forth, how it's structured. And then, of course, when the explanation is given, you've got it very easily, you can easily think about the text, meditate, of course, on it. Um, and in that way, well, you can't memorize, if you can memorize the whole text, that's best, but it would take a lot of time, and it's not uh, in all cases necessary. And so just with the, the titles of the outlines, um, you can reflect and meditate on this particular text. So here, there are very few outlines, the um, expression of worship, oh no, yes, oh, we did that already. So the expression of worship and um, the promise to, oh, I forgot to say that, the promise to, of course, compose this text. So actually the expression of, birth, of worship were only the first three lines, and then comes the, um, the, the promise to um, compose this text. So not every text starts with um, a promise to compose a text. Even in some texts, you don't explicitly have even an homage in some of the Tibetan texts. Sometimes it's more the promise that is given explicitly and the promises and the, and the worship is only implicit or vice versa or both. But anyway, there's this promise saying, I will teach this text, I will compose this text, um, usually for the author himself just made that promise. So continue and get to the end of it. 
Um, as we all know, it's very easy to start a job, but to bring it to completion is a different matter. So therefore here at the very beginning, it, the promise to compose the text. So the first three lines, I read them already. And then the last line is, as I utter these spontaneous words from thoughts flickering through my mind. That's actually not part of the uh, worship, but part of the promise. Okay. So then let's start with the actual text, the meaning of the actual text. Uh, in the beginning, a short, a short summary of what the text is going to be about, and then an extensive explanation. All right. So brief indication starts off with saying this lunatic child, this lunatic child, that's Changya Robodoja himself, calling himself lunatic. Lunatic in the sense, um, well, someone who's like a child, like ourselves, not understanding how phenomena really exist. So being caught in an existence that our mind has created. It's not that a creator God or anyone has brought us in that situation. No, it's our own mind that is responsible. The way we apprehend phenomena and out of this apprehension, the emotional states that this apprehension gives rise to, which then in turn lead to actions, body, speech, and mind, and that create basically our reality. We'll talk more about this. Um, but So what he's saying is we're like children in the sense that we've created this, this reality for ourselves. Lunatic, I mean, of course, the stuff we sometimes do, we just need to look at our own life. Um, I like the English word mad for getting angry. <laughs> when we get angry, I mean, it's one of those harmful emotions. We get mad. I mean, we get like, become like a lunatic. So here the author calls himself this lunatic child who lost his mother, his old mother, long ago. Okay, so what does mother refer to? Mother here, of course, refers to emptiness. It refers to the actual nature of phenomena, of how phenomena really exist. Here, the lunatic child, actually, strictly speaking, it's the mind of the author. It can refer to the author. It can refer to the mind of the author who lost his old mother. So the mind we can really like who we are is, of course, determined by our own mind, in particular not by the sense consciousnesses, by the, but by the mental consciousness, who we really are, whether we're kind or angry or, well, ignorant, whatever our qualities, those are qualities of the mental consciousness. Of course, there are also physical qualities, but more in terms of our personality, that is the result of our mental consciousness. Now, here, the author, uh, calling himself a lunatic child, the mind being lunatic, has lost his mother a long time ago. I mean, lost as in like, it sounds a bit like, well, if you lose something, you've had it before, and now you've lost it. But that's not literally the meaning. Basically he's saying, I've had my old mother the whole time with me, and I wasn't even aware of it. So it wasn't like that there was a time that he had his mother, he knew that he had his mother with him, he knew about emptiness, and now then he's lost his mother and now he's rediscovered her. That's not the meaning of this. So it's rather saying the aged mother here referring to either the nature of the mind itself, of this lunatic child, if it refers to the, if we see it as referring to the mental consciousness. So the emptiness of the mental consciousness, but it also refers to emptiness in general. And that he says he lost his mother a long time ago and is about to realize by chance what he has not recognized. Now, this is interpreted in different ways. Um, some would say it's about to realize means actually has already understood. It's not about to realize. It's kind of a modest way of saying, um, I've actually understood this. So it's, it's hard to believe that Changya Rubidoji is writing this text without having realized, without having realized emptiness. Um, but by chance means, and that's, I think it's quite interesting. It doesn't say that in the commentary, but when I read this by, by chance, it seems the spontaneity, this spontaneous insight 
And that's um, how usually insights work. I mean, we, of course, we do a lot of work on, on gaining a better understanding of the text. I mean, this is a year, life, lifelong process, lifetimes, a process that takes lifetimes. I mean, years, a whole life or lifetimes, depending on um, where we are. So it takes so much time. And if we practice, if we practice the Dharma, um continuously well there be insights there may be tiny little insights but they usually come spontaneous so not necessarily in the meditation they may also come in meditation but um they may also just come we're relaxed and suddenly there's a there's an insight into something so as a beginner like ourselves of course that they may be little things but for someone as advanced as the author here well he has had this insight by chance it's suddenly he's recognized how phenomena really exist has recognized that this mother has been with him all along so what is he saying in other words well i've been trapped in my own misapprehension of how phenomena really exist i've not been aware of the real nature of all phenomena that has been with me the whole time like an old mother has always been there um, the word mother, of course, is important. Emptiness being like a mother, wisdom being female, being like a mother. Um, so here, emptiness is described as mother in this, in the sense of wisdom. Like in order to understand emptiness, we need wisdom. Emptiness, just another word for the ultimate nature of phenomena. So we need we need wisdom to realize, to, to understand emptiness. And wisdom is said to be female. It's described as mother. For instance, when you study the Prashnaparamita Sutras or the Sutras of the Perfection of Wisdom, they're described as the mother sutras. Since they give rise, they give birth to the Buddhas. Okay, so compassion, compassion, bodhicitta, the method aspect of Buddhism, Usually it's just it's divided into method and wisdom, the method aspect, the more emotional aspect, love, compassion, those are seen as male, um, father aspect, if you like. And then there's the mother aspect, which is wisdom. And so here, the main object is the actual nature of phenomena, which is described, well, as a mother, old mother, because it has been around forever, I just haven't realized it yet. So in other words, we ourselves are like this lunatic child. Our mind is like a child, childish, not knowing, acting in a crazy way. And we just don't know that phenomena exist in a certain way, that this nature, this mother has always been around us. And hopefully we come to realize, recognize this, that emptiness has always been around. Okay, so this verse is not difficult to understand. Um, we know what the old mother refers to, the lunatic child. And then it goes on to say, she's perhaps that, that is and is not. In Tibetan, this is really difficult. This is not easily, yi, yi, min, min, it says. So it's already once, like, it's, it is, it is, it's not, it's not. Quietly spoken by my brother, dependent arising. So what does that say? Um, well, the mind mind here in the case of the author realizing the mind okay analyzing emptiness in this case realizing that emptiness has been with has been with all phenomena at all times and um, then once it has been has been understood well we then understand independence on well with the help of dependent arising that which previously seem to be that things are like this and like that, where we previously held on to them to be inherently or objectively existent, now we come to understand that they don't exist in that way, independence on the brother, which is dependent arising. Okay, so what does that mean? What does that mean? And now it's the time to say a little bit more about emptiness. And of course here, the brother dependent arising. The brother dependent arising, later on in the text, it mentions the father dependent arising. Now it's the brother. There's a reason for that. 
Um, here, dependent arising has many different levels. And the coarser level of dependent arising indicates, helps us to understand that phenomena do not exist the way they appear to us. On the subtler level of dependent arising, the very subtle level of dependent arising, that can only be understood once emptiness has been understood. So there's different levels of dependent arising, one level that helps us to understand emptiness. And once we've understood emptiness, then we can understand empty, we can understand dependent arising on the deepest level. And I'll say a little bit more about this, but first I want to say something about emptiness. Okay, so many of you have heard about it and um, you're familiar with it. Some of you have maybe not heard about it. So just to say a few words about this, for the mother so that the mother just becomes a little bit uh well we understand that better so we don't need to go into much more detail on 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 this text this is traditionally usually done you start slowly with the text and then later on when a lot of explanation has been given then you continue so i want to say now something speak more about what is this emptiness He's referring to this old mother and what is dependent arising he's speaking about. The brother here, brother dependent arising, as showing us, uh, kind of indicating, leading us into the direction of understanding what the mother is all about as like the correct reason. Now, correct reason. Um, if you studied philosophy, you're familiar with these ideas of like, a correct reason that indicates something, a correct sign as it's also called. As in like a, a concept such as emptiness is not obvious to us. It should be obvious to us. The only reason it's not obvious to us is that we have what is called ignorance. Right now, our mind is influenced by a wrong apprehension of reality. And that is so powerful. That wrong apprehension is so powerful in that it's ever present well ever present in the sense even when it lies dormant it influences us and through its presence even when it lies dormant it influences our mind to such a degree that phenomena always appear to us in such a way which does which is diametrically opposed to how they actually exist so this root as it's called ignorance or misapprehension, whichever you want to call it, that is responsible for the fact that for us, emptiness is hidden. For someone who's got no ignorance, it's not hidden at all. For a Buddha, it's not hidden. It's very obvious. But to us, it's hidden. It's that mind that, that hinders us, that prevents us from understanding emptiness. Emptiness being hidden means we cannot directly get at it. We need some other, we need something that is not as difficult to understand as emptiness. And in this case, that's a coarser level of dependent arising. There are other reasonings that you can use that indicate on the basis of which, so understanding this coarser level of dependent arising, which is here called the brother, based on that, we can understand that phenomena can not possibly exist the way they appear to us. In other words, we can understand emptiness. Okay, so first of all, emptiness, it's, it's a really weird word, actually. In English, it has a very negative connotation. But of course, it's a word we, we borrow from the English language, and it has a totally different meaning in English, uh, in, in the Buddhist context than in, in English. I mean, oh, my life is so empty. That's something negative. But actually, emptiness course, as you've probably heard, doesn't mean nothingness, and it's nothing negative at all. It's really just a word that's expressing the fact it's, it's negating, it's negating a certain characteristic that phenomena have never had, will never have, don't have right now, and nonetheless, we believe phenomena to have this characteristic. We believe that things exist, have a characteristic to exist in a way in which they cannot exist. So whether you call it objective existence or independent existence or inherent existence, it's just really hard. This is really difficult to understand. It's very difficult to understand what is meant here when we say our mind 
doesn't understand how phenomena really exist in that our mind adds it our mind kind of gives an existence or it, it gives a characteristics to phenomena it automatically believes them to have a certain characteristic which they don't have and emptiness is really just saying this is this is how things don't exist so it's just the absence of that added characteristic and that's what we have to understand so in order to understand what I'm talking about, this object of negation, and that's so hard, of course, I have very little time together, but let me just say uh, this much. The sense we have of this reality of what we perceive with our mind, just the things on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, there's definitely one object that we perceive very strongly, that's I, plays a huge role in our day-to-day -day life, but of course, also that which is mine. So my mind, my body, my family, my house, my possessions. Okay. Now, ir irrespective of what we're talking about, whether it's I or others, there is a sense that there is something very solid, something very concrete. For instance, when we talk about I, as if there was some concrete entity called I. Or when you talk about the body, there's something that is my body, something very concrete there. Another example would be a table, something concrete there that we call the table. And so, of course, when you look at the table, you have a surface, you have legs of a table. For us, it seems the table, it's, it's, of course, connected to its parts, but the table is not the parts, it's not the leg, it's not the surface. There's something extra. There's something more than that. So the sense of there's more than just the parts is really something that we call table or with regard to the eye. Who am I as a person? So I refer to myself as I, other people refer to myself as you, for instance, but just from my own perspective, the sense of I, it's not the mind, it's not the body, there's something more than that. There's this, this, this entity I call I, which I have to protect. There's a sense I have to protect it. There's a sense it's more important, more precious than others. And certainly that which is mine, my well-being, it's more important. Now, this extra extra as in like there's something really solid something very essential something inherent there well that's where the mistake lies that's where the mistake lies so when you take the table to just say plainly since we don't have that much time the table we just label we just designate table on the basis of its parts we label table Table exists because there are certain parts assembled in a certain way. And based on that, we say table. That's it. So we just call it a table. But for us, it seems beyond us calling that a table, there's really something there. There's something there that holds these parts together. There's some essence there, some tableness that makes it a table. So we perceive more than there actually is with regard to the eyes, the same thing. There's a mind, there's a body. And so when the mind thinks something, I say, I think something. Really what's doing the thinking is the mind. And when the body moves, I say, I move. But to us, it seems there's more than that. There's more than that. So if you bump into me, for instance, you kind of bump into me. Okay, really what happens is you bump into my arm or you, you hit a piece of skin. And actually the eye really in, in, in actuality, the eye is just, well, because the way we, our mind labels, and this is the part of the mind that's not incorrect, labeling on the basis of whatever happens to mind or body, we label eye. But then, we're so used due to our basic misapprehension to add more to it. After there was the thought, I, someone bumped into me, 
our mind is no longer satisfied. It's not satisfied with just I, with just, just labeled on the part of this body. There seems to be someone bumped into this body and some extra I. And that extra I that my mind has, well, created since since beginning this time. I mean, there's always been that sense because we don't understand that that creation is impossible because we don't understand the mother, actually the absence of that. Well, that sense of an I, that sense of something extra there gives rise to attachment. I am more important, I'm precious. Anger when someone harms this I and so forth. So all our emotions arise from that exaggeration, this exaggerated sense, there's something more than there actually is. And that's so hard to, to understand, it's so hard to, to recognize that it's called the object of negation, that which we actually negate. We don't negate the I. No one is saying that there's no I, no labeled I on the basis of mind and body. I call it I, and that's it. Okay, someone bumps into me, I say, oh, bumped into me, because I label on the basis of this body, I label I. And so my body, therefore, if there's a conventional, as it's called, a conventional I, well, if you bump into me, I say someone bumped into me based on that body. But like I said, there's a sense there's more than that. There's really something there that was, I mean, how dare they bumped into me. And if maybe, you know, they were dirty and there's a bit of dirt, like a stain left on my shirt or whatever, oh, they, they, ooh, they'd say there's dirt on me. They, they, um, they, they spoiled me or they, they stained me as if there was something separate. Well, when I think, when I think, so my mind is thinking, I label I'm thinking, there's a sense there's something else as well that's thinking, a separate entity that's also thinking. And that's, of course, more than that. Not just, I mean, I don't just think of myself as I. There's a whole sense of identity of who I am. I, so I as German, as being German, as being a nun, as being a woman, as being, um, what else? A woman of the 21st century and being a daughter and being a sister, uh, a cousin, an aunt and so forth. So there's a collage of, well, different labels I use to, to refer to myself. Always in relation to something. So in relation to, for instance, my body and certain attitudes I have, I label woman. Or in dependence on my official, my, my passport and my, my official uh, nationalities, I label German. But it seems there's something more. There's some Germanness to me. Something there. Something that's got nothing to do with me just labeling. I've got this internal, this, this inherent Germanness, this inherent womanness. It's not my, my female parts, I mean, the body parts that distinguish me from other um, genders, or of course, my attitude that's also part of it. No, there's some, something more to it. And being a sister, I mean, it's really. In relation to my, my sister or in dependence on my sister, I call myself a sister, but there seems there's more than that. There's a sisterness within me. It's not there. It's just labeled. And some example that may be helpful is, for instance, when we label, we don't just do it with ourselves, we also do it with other people. Like when you, when, well, when before um, Obama was, was, elected as the president right i mean it was a guy from chicago right i mean we didn't know him we saw him for the first time i mean it was a senator i'm sure so he was a senator first and there was no sense he's the president and then he was elected good news 2008 he was elected and suddenly we labeled president we labeled president on the basis of this person mind and body we labeled president just labeled. No presidentness could be found within him. So we just labeled. And then suddenly it seemed as if this presentness, being a president, almost like it was tattooed on his forehead. From that time onwards, for the next eight years, 
oh, it's a president. There's something president, presidentness coming from the side of the object. It, it doesn't seem like we've just, of course, we, we labeled it. It made sense. He was a, elected. He was voted to be the, the president. So it wasn't like we were labeling just anything. No, there was a basis. There was a correct basis. Based on that, we call him the president. But our mind then, somehow it seems there's a, a presidentness within him. It's not just labeled. There's more to it. And one of my teachers, he gave the example, and I've talked about this on many occasions, I give the same example. He gives the example of a disciplinarian in a monastery who's frequently, they, they change the position in the big monasteries. I think it's two years, someone has holds the position of being a disciplinarian. And he's appointed by the abbot on the basis of certain qualities, of certain abilities, um, certainly having some nature that that well that people find i mean he, he 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 what's the word kind of causes respect in others i mean others are uh, respectful towards him so anyway there's a certain quality that he has and then based on that he's called the the um the disciplinarian and people first have to, of course, now label, I mean, disciplinarian. I mean, usually the monks, like the naughty ones in particular, they're very careful around the disciplinarian. And so they label and every time there's a, oh, there's a, oh, there's a disciplinarian. At the institute with I st where I studied, we're also mainly monks. And we also always had a disciplinarian. And you will always be careful to behave in a certain way in the presence of this disciplinarian. So previously it was just an ordinary older, usually an older monk, um, one of the higher classes. And then suddenly oh, you had to, okay, disciplinarian. And there was a sense of fear to a certain degree. I mean, a healthy kind of fear. Oh, I have to be careful. But it took some time to get used to it. So every time you saw the discipline, oh, oh, the discipline, oh, he's the he's the new disciplinarian. But before long, to our mind, to my mind, it seemed this person is the disciplinarian, as if it was coming from this of his own side. It was not just labeled. He was not just appointed. He was the disciplinarian. He had some disciplinarianness to him, and that's when our mind sets in after the designation, and it seems. We called him the disciplinarian because he is, he's got this within him. Actually, it's the other way around. It's, got, it's like he is the disciplinarian only because he was designated. He was called the disciplinarian. Not that he is being a disciplinarian is inherent in him. And now we call him that. No, it's exactly the other way around. There's nothing inherent in him that makes him the disciplinarian. There's nothing in a table that makes it, there's nothing inherent in the table that makes it the table. We just called it that. And therefore it's a table. There's nothing inherent within me that makes it an I, which is why I call it an I. No, I call it an I and therefore there is an I. That's it. So with the disciplinarian, the story of course goes on because before long, like I said, there's a new disciplinarian and there's a bit of fear and respect for that person. and. At some point, well, this term is over and now someone else becomes the disciplinarian. And if the disciplinarian, the old one comes around the corner, there's still, oh, there's the discipline. I oh, know he's not. Oh no, he isn't. There's a new person. So there's still a sense, wow, there's this. And if we meet Obama now, it will never leave him. He's always going to be the ex-president, right? It's just labeled, but it always seems to something from the side of Obama that makes him the president. If you look for this, can't be found. If you look for that, won't be found. So emptiness really means the absence of this particular quality, of this sense there's really something intrinsic, there's something inherent in this person. That's got nothing to do with, 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 with labeling. It's just we, we, we call this person this, that, and the other because they are already from themselves, they are already that. But that's where our mistake lies. From the side of the object, from the side of this person, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. It's just labeled. So we have this very 
in the texts, of course, all this analysis, dependent arising, as I said, the brother dependent arising, it points us in that direction as in saying, well, look, there's, if, if something was really, if, if something was intrinsic to the object, then it wouldn't depend on anything. It wouldn't depend on anything. So let me give you another example. An example that may help to uh, clarify that further. We do use this, this idea of something is inherent or naturally this, that, and the other. The example that is often given is that of water. We have a sense that water is naturally wet. Okay, we call that and in everyday life, that's okay. I mean, in everyday life, we also talk about independent country, right? We talk about an independent country. We talk about seeing things objectively, or we say, oh, water is naturally wet. But if we analyze this, so when we say water is naturally wet, this is quite similar here. For instance, if I say, is water naturally warm? You would say, no, water is not naturally warm. Why is it not naturally warm? Because in order for water to be warm, you need something other than the water to make it warm. You need a, a source of like a, a heating source. And when you apply this heating source, then the water will become warm. So if the water was naturally warm, you wouldn't need anything else for it to be warm. Therefore, we say water is not inherently or naturally, inherent really just means naturally, from its own side, just naturally wet. But from a Buddhist point of view, water is also not naturally wet or inherently wet because you need lots of other factors. You need other factors for that wetness to be there. For instance, you need someone perceiving it as wet. I mean, we perceive it as wet, as humans. Take fire, take heat. Our body reacts to a certain temperature and therefore we say it's hot based on that. But it's, the heat is very interesting. I mean, if you go to India, certain places in India that can be really, really hot in the summer. When we go to those places, I mean, coming from Germany, where it, well, before global warming, warming, it didn't get that hot. Now it does too. But where traditionally, it's quite cold. When you come to those places and there's like, I don't know, Fahrenheit, 22 degrees, that's kind of Celsius, like, I don't know how Fahrenheit, maybe, maybe 80 or something, like a comfortable temperature. Um, an Indian would probably wear his down jacket. If it usually gets really hot, so sometimes you get to places when you're like, oh, sweating, it's so hot. And you see this Indian person wrapped in a thick coat because for them, it's cold. So now for me, it's hot, for them, it's cold. What is it? Cold or It depends, it depends. So fire, it's hot because us as human beings, as living beings, to us, it's hot. If there were a sentient being to, to whom this the hotness of fire were to appear differently, well, to that being, it would not be naturally hot. Or if water reacted differently, um, the wetness of water in a different universe, well, then it wouldn't be wet. So we need our own sense perception in order for water to be wet. And it needs other factors. It needs oxygen. It needs lots of other factors that are different to the wetness. It needs I don't know, physical, from the biological or physical point of view, or like a point of from the point of view of physics, what you need exactly to have water for water to be hot. For fire, is definitely oxygen that you need. Um, water, yes, hydrogen, and hydrogen, of course, is not the water, and oxygen is not the water. So you need things other than the than the water itself for water to be wet. Therefore, it's not inherent in the water because it's dependent on other factors and has labeled water on the basis of these factors, other than this wetness, we label wetness. Same is true for fire. This heat, as I said, it seems is within this fire, but unless there was someone perceiving us as heat, where would that heat be? 
Now, the example I gave, the last example I gave, is a little difficult to understand. It takes a little bit more. If you have some background in the in Buddhist philosophy, it's a little easier to understand. But it's it's quite difficult. It needs a bit of study of of what I'm talking about, a bit of better understanding. But the point I'm trying to make is that nothing exists in and of itself independent on other factors as hot or cold as disciplinarian or president as i or body mind and so forth everything is just labeled on a particular basis okay and the, the parts that make so everything is cons consists of parts and based on these parts, so we say conventionally, yes, there's a table. Conventionally, there's fire. Conventionally, there's I and others, as in like being designated on a certain basis. But when you analyze among the spaces, when you look within the spaces, can you find this particular person? Can you find the disciplinarian? Can you find the table? No, you won't. You won't be able to find it. Why? because it's a phenomenon that's dependent on causes that gave rise to it. It gets dependent on parts. And of course it's dependent on someone calling it this, that, and the other. Okay. So dependence, like dependent arising, I said early on, it's the brother here. It's the brother dependent arising in that if you just take, and dependence means different things. It can mean dependence on certain causes. If a phenomenon has causes, then in dependence on causes, something has come into existence. So it cannot be inherently, it cannot be intrinsically the way it appears to us. It just is hot. Well, because if it just were that in and of itself, without needing these other factors, well, no causes could have created it. It would have already existed. It would have already been there. And also, if it's already there, then it wouldn't have parts. It wouldn't, it wouldn't need parts. It's already there. It doesn't need it's in and of itself a disciplinary, and it's in and of itself a table and so forth. It wouldn't need those parts. And it certainly wouldn't need some calling it such. But if we remove just that label, if we remove the label I, where's the I? If we remove the label table or anything else we associate with this object we call table, if we were to remove that, we would be left with everything but table. So I'm already putting in a lot of ideas here. I'm putting in a lot of aspects here, which may be quite confusing. And I'm hoping, well, if you have some background, it's a little helpful just in that process of, of reflecting on that. I'll take questions in a moment. Um, well, this is really what this text is talking about. So really what Changya Rabadurja is telling us, we've been like lunatics. We've been so childish. We've suffered. I mean, I mean children, children can greatly suffer because of their confusion. I mean, we all remember when it was what it was like to be a kid. So to be confused oftentimes, to be fearful, to have fear in certain situations. So in a way, we are like a child. We're like a lunatic. Our mind is like a lunatic. Why? Because we constantly add to phenomena. We constantly believe that there is more to phenomena than there are really are especially to the eye. Our whole life, our whole life is dedicated towards looking after this eye. So as one of my teachers very nicely put it once, we are, we are looking after something. So the way he puts it, one of my teachers puts it this way. Like, let's say you look after another person, you look after someone all the time you have to look after them from morning to evening this other person tells you make coffee you go and you make coffee get me a shower you get a shower i need this food i need that food i need to see this person i need to make a phone call i need to if someone were to kind of boss you around the whole time um without payment how long could we do it being like a slave to someone really without payment you're being bossed around 
Well, two weeks at the most. <laughs> we are bossed around by our own eye. I mean, it starts off in the morning. I open my eyes and I go, oh, I need coffee. I need this. I need that. And then my mind and body really have to work hard to then get this, get that, and so forth. But actually, from a Buddhist point of view, it's our mind is driven by an attachment to a type of eye that doesn't exist in the way it appears to us, the way we apprehend it. There's a sense there's something more than that. There's more than just an eye that is labeled, that is called eye on the basis of mind and body. There's more to it. And that I will hold on to that. Our mind holds on to this, this I, it exaggerates its existence, and we become a slave of our own self-centeredness. This that's the, the name of the, the mind that's the, well, it's, really it's an attachment. It's like holding on to an I that has been created by our own mind, an exaggerated version of what's really there, and then holding because it's eyes over here it's here close to my mind and therefore i'm feeling this is more precious this eye is more precious than all the other eyes or the other all the other people and that's more precious and this mind that holds this to be more precious all the time is trying to protect it is trying to look after its happiness its well-being and we're basically a slave to that and of course it gives rise to anger when someone is harming this this projected eye, this 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 exaggerated version of what's really there, there is jealousy, which is well a, a mixture between attachment. I want something. I feel like I, I can only be happy if I get that. That's the attachment part, and aversion towards a person who has what I don't have. So it's a mixture between attachment and aversion. And of course, there's arrogance and all sorts of other afflictive emotions, which in turn lead to, so these are afflictive emotions are just extreme emotions, extreme emotions based on an extreme perception of ourselves and other things. And that leads to, to extreme actions, which have extreme results, which we call suffering because they're experiences we don't like. They're, they're, they're extreme in that, they're beyond a peace of mind that they the peace of mind that we want a sense of satisfaction well that doesn't set in because the root cause is an exaggeration it's seeing things in an extreme way and that leads to an extreme experience which is suffering so that's really the the, the buddhist view that we suffer we only we have problems just because we don't understand that the the, the, the way phenomena really exist Okay, we've talked for an hour and what is it, 20 minutes? So let's take some questions if you have some questions. I apologize for not going through the text further, but I thought just for those of you who are totally new to these ideas, and of course some explanation needs to be given as on, uh, on emptiness and what that means. And of course, for those uh, who already know about it, just a reminder, and now I'll open it to discussions or to a discussion or any questions you like you'd like to ask if you already put them in the um, chat and I just read from there otherwise you're welcome um, you can raise this little hand I know there's a hand somewhere that you can click on yep there's already someone used their little hand okay go ahead Andy. good morning um good morning. I put this in chat but I'm curious why oh, emptiness as a negation phenomena that's based on ignorance is considered the ultimate truth and not dependent arising, which seems to be the way that phenomena actually abide. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So now I just discovered the brain. Oh, right. So what's your question? And your question is why is it dependent arising? Why is not dependent arising the ultimate nature but emptiness? Okay. Yeah. Well, the reason is that. Well, ultimate nature, of course, it's only labeled ultimate nature independence on some other factor, of course. Well, one of the reasons is definitely, oops, no, I made a mistake. Um, one of the reasons is definitely that, well, our misperception, the, the misperception of, for instance, ourselves is not a misperception that believes the I exists independently. We don't believe that. 
That would be the consequence, okay? So our mind does not automatically hold on to the I existing independently. So there's no innate sense that I exist over there. That would mean I would innately have a sense of myself, of being over there, if you like, disconnected to mind and body. There's no innate sense that the I exists independently of mind and body, okay? So if you've, you may have heard this in the, in the text, it talks about the, some non-Buddhist philosophers who assert that there is an I that is permanent and partless and independent of mind and body. That is an intellectual sense of an I, okay? It's created by ideas, intellectual ideas, philosophical ideas, based on our innate sense there's something inherently there but this sense that this this i exists totally independent we don't have that innately there is a sense actually that the eye is connected to mind and body but still separate which means therefore when we say the i exists inherently therefore it has to exist independently that is just the that would just be the logical consequence if the I existed, if hypothetically the I did exist the way it appeared to us, then it would have to be totally independent of mind and body, or it would have to be one with mind and body, right? That's the only option. If the I existed the way it appeared to us, then it could not be dependent. It would either be totally separate or one with mind and body, because if it's one with mind and body, it doesn't depend on itself. That wouldn't make sense. And so you don't have the problem with dependence. However, as I said, innately, it doesn't feel that the eye is totally separate from mind and body. I still say my mind, my body at all times. So there's every sense of connection, which is why our misapprehension does not, our basic misapprehension does not believe that phenomena exist dependently which would then of course mean, oh yeah, the absence of dependence. In other words, their independence, that's their ultimate nature. No, the ultimate nature is the absence of this quality that we ascribe to them of existing beyond mere labeling. Does that make sense, Andrew? So the ultimate nature is here given in relation to the opposite of the object that we mistake, mistakenly perceive. So the, the, the so the Go ultimate ahead. nature is is defined in terms of our fundamental ignorance, essentially. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Our fundamental ignorance. But the reason I gave all this previous explanation was that sometimes, in order for us to understand, especially as beginners, understand better the idea of emptiness or the object of negation, the word independent is used. So it seems as if we perceive phenomena to exist independently. No, we don't actually perceive them. Like I said, it, hypothetically, if they existed inherently, they would have to be independently, but we don't perceive it that way. And yes, in answer to that, it's in relation to our basic misapprehension that we call it the ultimate nature. Mm. Okay, thank you. Sure, no. all right, there's another hand. If there there's more another question in the chat room. Oh, yes. I'll just open it. Yeah. You want me to read it to you? Uh, no, I've got it right here. So Karl yeah. Brunholz also translated this text with Mikram's commentary. Oh, very good. Uh, so I'm just not, if you want to print out. Okay. Yeah, maybe you. Oh, Andrew Hughes. Oh, he puts it. Jennifer. Okay. Within our tradition and the emphasis on the Lama, it seems very easy to defy the being. And placing the Lama on the throne during prostrations, etc., could evoke feelings of inherent goodness and inherent power of the Lama. How might we apply the concept of emptiness when viewing the demonic aspect of the Lama? Yes, yes, Jennifer, very good. Um, you're absolutely right. This is where you see, like anything that is extremely beneficial, anything that's very beneficial can also be very dangerous. I mean, look at nuclear uh, atomic what do you call it nuclear power i mean if it's used in the right way very powerful but of course can also be used, if used in the wrong way very harmful the same is true for this idea of the lama emphasis on the lama seems to deify the being yes that is so true 
And therefore, an understanding of emptiness, of course, is extremely important in that, well, how do we apply the concept of emptiness? Well, for instance, of course, uh, Nagarjuna said in his, um, in his um, fundamental wisdom, the Tathagata is not one, so he's not one with his parts, he's not separate from the parts, uh, it's, not, um, it's, it's not within the, or it doesn't depend, the parts don't depend, or the aggregates don't depend on the Tathagata, he doesn't possess, so who is the Tathagata? This is this verse where actually Nagarjuna is dealing exactly with this issue. So not only do we have a sense of an I that is truly there, we have the sense with the Buddha. In fact, that's our problem. That's exactly our problem. When we, when we find emptiness, um, when we discover emptiness, when we start to learn about emptiness, we start to now have less of a sense that, well, maybe anger is less inherently existent, but love seems to be more inherently existent. Me as an ordinary person, okay, I'm not that important. Um, Non-enlightened sentient beings, they're less, less inherently important, but the lamas are. There's just the more important something seems, the stronger our sense of inherent existence. And there we need to, of course, it's very important to then analyze, well, put on the throne. Why are they put on the throne? For our own sake. The Lama doesn't care. <laughs> sit on the throne or sit on the street. I mean, a qualified Lama, of course. It's for our own sake. Um, so if I, if I offer, make offering, offer my service, it's only for my own sake. So to recognize that the Lama, of course, as Nagarjuna says in the in his fundamental wisdom as he uh, gives this verse, well, the Lama, the Lama is not one with his aggregates. If the Lama existed the way the Lama appears to me, so the Lama is not, then he or she, well, let's say he would be either one with the aggregates or separate, can't find him. And if that inherent person, the way it appears to me, well, if, if it were to if it were to own the aggregates, if it were the, the, if the aggregates were dependent on him, then it would be totally separate from the aggregates because something that depends on something else, they have to be separate. The other way around with the aggregates depending on him, again, it would be a separate entity. That wouldn't work. And anyway, I can't find a lamaness within this person, which is why, it's important in our own practice when we find, oh, we put this person on the throne and especially attachment to the Lama. Oh, it's a classic, classic. I mean, look at the groupie, uh, the, the groupie kind of mentality that we find with like people following his homes, the, the, his homes, uh, the Kamapa, uh, Lama Zoparumpachi, his homes, the Lama. Of course, all these Lamas having like a these groupies around them, there's so much attachment. And we cannot change it and other people, but just use this understanding of emptiness and say this person and come to the same conclusion. It's not one with the aggregates, not separate from the aggregates. There's certain qualities of the mind that of course this person cannot give to me, but through their teachings, they can they can teach me exactly what they have learned. And if I put them into practice myself, I reach the same state, that's it, okay? So to get, to get rid of this emotional attachment we have, get rid of the sense of something intrinsic in them, well, the same reasonings apply, of course. So applying these reasonings as described, well, in this text and in other texts, um, the only way to do it is really go through the analysis that I just described. There's no other way around it. But of course, you need to first recognize, has my attachment shifted? Maybe it's not towards a man any longer, in the case of a woman or a man, or maybe another woman. Now it's shifted towards the Lama. We need to first recognize, has that attachment, has that misapprehension now uh, been transferred to that person? And if yes, well, go through the same meditation. There's no, no other solution but then but analyzing. Is it one with the parts, separate from the parts? Where is that 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 deityness? Where's that that divinity in that person? I won't be able to find it. It's merely labeled. So I hope that's a little helpful, or that it at least answered your question.
sorry, I'm still struggling with this chat thing. Okay, Jennifer. So yeah, Jennifer, if you've got a follow up on that, because I don't, I can't see you. Um, Hello, I don't know if you could see oh, me. Yes. Now you've got the chat in front of your face. There you are. Okay. Yes, oh, Jennifer, yes. I know you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> it's so wonderful. Uh, uh, lovely. So much. Um, yeah, I guess then a follow up question is um, Do you think in the West that starting with Guru devotion is necessarily a healthy way to proceed? Because I've just seen so many issues mm. come up based on that with our cultural conditioning and you know our mm. general lack of realization. Yeah, no, no, I think that's why a lot of lamas, of course, leave it out. A lot of teachers, when they teach the Lamrim, for instance, they don't mention it to the same degree as it would be mentioned traditionally in Tibet. I mean, I think it's still good to explain it right from the beginning because people are sucked into this whole issue of the Lama right away. And to right away uh, make sure that this is a mental connection, it's a mental it's it's like I said, it's mental as in like you're trying to see this person as an example and learn from their example. And when you put them on the throne and you it's only for our own benefit. I mean, when we study Buddhism, we learn about the psychology. It, Buddhism is a kind of psychology. It's a, it's, a, it's a means of psychotherapy. Devotion is just very helpful for the mind. Devotion is really helpful. It's this, the Lama doesn't care. Devotion is not for the Lama. The Lama doesn't care. You don't, like a qualified Lama doesn't care you hate or you love them. I mean, in the, in the, in Chandakirti's um, entry into the middle way, it talks about, for instance, if you apply to even a realized be, even a, a liberated being, leave aside someone who's, well, high advanced on the Bodhisattva path, that most lamas in this tradition usually are. Um, so if you apply, I don't know, kind of you massage the, the one arm and you cut off the other arm, if there are two people, like, you know, you, 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 you massage one arm and another person cuts off the arm of this lama. On the other hand, the lama has the same compassion towards po both people, whether one person massages them or the other person cuts off their arm love and compassion are exactly the same so no matter what you do the compassion from the lama is the same but what pleases the lama of course pleases in the sense wanting the best for you so when they see that you you you're inspired by the lama you have devotion towards the lama devotion is just a state of mind that's very healthy it it um, it's a sense of joy, actually joy. Joy in Buddhism is very important. It relaxes the mind and leads to a sense of joy. This relaxed and joyful mind is the perfect basis for practice. And devotion also is a sense of inspiration so that I want more. I'm not satisfied with this worldly happiness I have. I want to become like this person. That's why devotion is important because it's psychologically very, very healthy. Okay. So it's almost like a feeling of being in love without all the garbage. Okay. When you're newly in love, right? With the Lama, it's like this when you're newly in love, you're not attached to this person yet. When you're newly in love, you're not attached to that person. And there's just a joy when you just hear them talk, when you hear his homeless talk. And therefore, you take in his words in a very different way and want to practice. You're much more willing to practice. That's why this kind of devotion is helpful. The Lama doesn't care. The Lama doesn't care only from the point of view of beneficial to you. So if you see it that way, see it that way, it's beneficial to yourself. It really helps ourselves in the psychological way. Then I think it loses the sense of, it's no danger. You just benefit from them. Okay. Thank you. I've never heard devotion expressed in that way. I really appreciate it. But we have to be careful because initially, this is why a lot of people are in love with the Lama. Okay. This is where you have to be. And I see it again and again, people fall in love. You can see it. So this is where we have to, to be careful to not turn it into attachment, to have that sense of devotion. Remember that emptiness, the way I talked about it early on. And in that way, don't get attached. And that's difficult, very difficult. Okay, great. 
So um, um, I don't know how to pronounce his, this name, Wilhelm. Um, anyway, so the object of negation is the wet itself or only its inherent existence. Good. In terms of the water, the wetness is not, of course, that's not, like I said, it's only an example, like the wetness as being an inherent quality, but it's saying like wetness is not negated here, but as an inherent quality, as inherent in the sense that it just is wet. It needs nothing else. Remember the example of the heat source, the source of heating? We say water is not naturally hot or naturally cold, because it needs an outside temperature or what have you, or a, a source of heating to be warm or hot or cold. However, it's naturally wet. It doesn't need anything. It just is wet. But that's not true either. Um, it's not inherently wet. It is wet, conventionally wet. Why? Because it's dependent on certain causes. Of course, water has causes to give rise to the wetness. It has parts that are other than the wetness that are responsible for the wetness. So uh, the, the hydrogen, oxygen, as to the molecules that make up water. And of course, also a body that perceives it as wet, right? You need to have someone perceiving it as wet. Um, wetness is something that we perceive with our body consciousness, really. What, what is wetness other than what we experience with a body consciousness? So it's dependent on these factors that then we label actually really the sensation that water gives our skin, that water causes in our skin, we label it as wet. Okay. Warmth is the same thing. I mean, heat, heat, it's, it's just the rapid movement of molecules. Oh gosh, I, I hope I'm saying the right thing. Like, like in, I'm thinking of like a, is it called a microwave? Um, but really heat, when we say the heat of fire, well, that's just experienced by body consciousness. If no one experienced heat, how can we say uh, fire is hot? So in the same way, therefore, fire is not inherently hot, but it's dependent on many different factors. And in the end, of course, also our perception of it as hot, that based on that, we label it as hot. There's no hotness found within fire. Okay. Great. Um, we've got time for another question. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so I've answered uh, all the ones in the chat. Yes, please. There's one more question in the chat um, by Maureen. Are the teachings themselves also not inherently existent? Sorry, can you repeat that? Are the, are the teachings themselves also not inherently existent? Uh, they don't exist inherently. The teachings themselves don't exist inherently. I mean, what do you mean with teachings anyway? With certain things, it's easier to understand. I mean, like something as concrete as a stone, like objects we can perceive with our senses, it's actually sometimes harder to understand that there's really nothing there. But then teachings, it's so abstract. What are teachings? Are those the words? Is that the meaning? Um, teaching as in like the words and the meanings or the teachings that you've internalized? Because in Buddhism, both are said to be teachings. We talk about the realizational teachings and the scriptural teachings. The scriptural teachings are the words and the meaning. Well, the words that convey a certain meaning. So we talk about scriptural teachings as not just anyone's teachings, like by a lama, really, like um, by the Buddha or by a great master who has internalized whatever the Buddha has taught. And those words that they, like here, the text we are learning here, coming from the experience on that, from that person, that is called a teaching. So labor, on the basis of the words spoken with a certain motivation, the words and the meaning, based on that, we call it teaching. That is the scriptural teachings. That's the label we give to all these different parts, like I said, the words and based on the, the motivation and so forth, we label it the scriptural teachings. And if then you internalize these words, 
those, those words are really not the actual teachings. The actual teachings are the realizations. I mean, just upon hearing the words, of course, you won't be able to gain the internal teachings. You need to digest them if you want to use a, a everyday kind of term. So you need to do something with them to come to an understand, to come to a first understanding of the meaning of what has been taught. This is why the teachings themselves will not lead to understanding. First, you need to hear them. You need to reflect on them and meditate on them so that you yourself attain understanding of them. And that understanding, that realization, that's called the realizational teaching. Then you carry the teaching within you and you can share them with others through your own words. But again, these realizations, they're only labeled internal teachings or realizational teachings. Again, you can't really find them. Is it this mental quality or that mental quality? No, it can't be found, but we label it nonetheless. Therefore, whether you say the scriptural teachings or the realizational teachings, just label, don't exist inherently. But because they don't exist inherently, they work. They work. Because if they existed inherently, they'd be self-contained and they couldn't, they couldn't, we couldn't interact with them. That's what's so important. If things really existed the way they appear to us, we couldn't communicate with them. We couldn't do anything with them. Because they're merely labeled and therefore dependent on labeling, on causes, conditions, and so forth we can do something with them, we can interact with them and we can benefit from them. But yeah, it, for us, like I said, it's actually to someone who's understood emptiness, like a Buddha, like a highly realized being, it's an obvious fact. To us, it seems the opposite. For us, for us, it seems to, to, for a teaching to be effective, it has to be inherently, it has to be inherently a teaching. For a Lama to be highly realized, this person needs to be inherently highly realized. This is the problem we have because our mind is diametrically opposed to how phenomena really exist. Okay, I've got two more, three more messages. Oh, okay. Okay, people have to leave. Yes, I understand that. Um, well, usually I teach much longer, but Sheila, I guess it's probably a good idea to stop here, right? I can just continue answering questions, but um, if you, I'll leave it up to you. What would you prefer? Um, I don't see any more questions, so I think we can stop here. Okay, all right, good. So let's leave it at this. This was only a rough kind of introduction and I haven't really gone into the text um, more detail which i'll do next time i felt it was important to at least address emptiness to some degree but of course we cannot uh, stick with emptiness throughout the whole time we'll have to go into the text and hopefully uh, it will become a little clearer as we continue anyway thank you for uh, your time for your patience listening and uh, i'll see you again next week i think next week we have saturday and sunday and please as i said read it in advance um, if you haven't already done so, please um, read the commentary, maybe the notes. Um, the commentary is definitely more important and the root text, most important, most important. Okay, great. So all that's left um, at the end of this, this session is to, of course, dedicate whatever positive potential we've accumulated together to the dedicated and we'll, we'll, we will of course uh, um, recite some dedication prayers but what's most important is the mental state so let's generate the right kind of attitude before we actually go through the uh, the words so to dedicate in it in such a way that let's think well may whatever positive potential we've accumulated um, lengthens the life of our spiritual masters like His Holiness the Dalai Lama so that they may continue to share their realizational teachings with us. May it also, very importantly, lead to our own enlightenment so that in the future we will attain 
same state as the great lamas, the same state as the Buddha himself, not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. And may even right here and right now, whatever positive potential we've accumulated, may it positively affect the people around us, make some change, however subtle it is, bring more peace of mind, more inner peace uh, to the people around us. And so it is with this attitude, with this thought, let's recite the prayers. Well, please, Sheila, if you can lead the dedication prayers. I cannot hear Sheila, you. You're muted. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Let's start again. Okay. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all sentient beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel of Bodhicitta that has not arisen rise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Due to the merits of the three times collected by me, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and all other sentient beings, which are totally non-existent from their own side, may the eye, which is also totally non-existent from its own side, achieve Guru Shakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment, which is also totally non-existent from its own side, and lead all sentient beings who are, who are totally non-existent from their own side, that enlightenment, which is totally non-existent from its own side by myself alone, who is also totally non-existent from its own side. Thank you. That sounds like, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh. For His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, wish-granting, wish-fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparable Kind Tenzin Gatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Thank you very much. That sounded like Lama Zoparumbachia's dedication prayer. The, yes, the one before that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, be safe and be well. And I see you again next week, same time. Uh, also Saturday, right? It's the ninth. Yes. yes, Saturday and Sunday will be next weekend. That's right. So, okay. Yes. Thank you, Gishima. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night, Gishima. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Bye.